You have a T-shirt. If you get to the end, I survived the whole day. Well, well done. Well done. And uh, well done to those that prepared the lunch. I don't think they're in the room, but that was great, wasn't it? <laughs> Hopefully they were thanked downstairs, were they? Yeah. Phil. Yeah, sweet. yeah, yeah. They feel thanked. Yeah. Good, good. No, it's fantastic. Very good. Uh, and, and so here we are. Now, that, as you all know, this is what they term the graveyard slot. So uh, do your best to stay awake and console yourself with the fact that in an hour it will all be over. And uh, it will be fine. <laughs> So this was my plan, <laughs> to uh, spend the first session talking about the purpose of small groups, which I wanted to major on the theme of making disciples, uh, to spend the second section talking about some of the dynamics that one would expect to see within small groups that are shaped for that purpose, and then in this session to talk about uh, the leadership, more specifically about the leadership of small groups and what is required of leaders in those kind of groups. However, there were a few things that I didn't quite get to this morning. So there's a, there's a kind of a little buffer bit before we get to the third bit of the island, uh, which is a bit of leftovers. <laughs> so like eating up leftovers. Uh, uh, one thing I want to say, and it is about leadership actually, uh, so we are sort of in the right territory uh, as, as we move forward. I want to point you to this verse in Hebrews, which talks about holding unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. It's nice to know that's not a, a completely modern problem, isn't it? Uh, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And I just want to pick up the, the connection that there is there between the first verse, keeping going, holding unswervingly, living the life, being a disciple, that's my paraphrase of what's implicit there, um, and the second bit, the importance of how we can help one another with that journey. If you want to hold unswerving to the hope you profess, then we need the help of one another um, encouraging us and spurring us on towards love and good deeds. And it seems to me that could almost be a motto verse for the kind of small groups I'm trying to describe today that that's kind of what we're there for. And notice the richness of the one another language that's there in that verse. You may quickly think that that one anothering uh, language is all over the New Testament. I'm sure you could quickly remind me of some of them. But of course the headline one another is in John 13, where Jesus himself says that this is the authenticating mark of whether or not you're a disciple, it's the quality of life within your community. A new commandment I give to you, you must love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you're my disciples. In other words, there is something intrinsically uh, foundational about the lives that we lead together and the quality of life that we lead together in our Christian communities, churches, small groups. And I would see that the rest of the one another's in the New Testament, which are all over the place when you start to look for them, are a way of interpreting what Jesus was getting at there. So what does it mean to love one another? Well, the rest of the New Testament supplies us with lots and lots of different takes on that. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Live in harmony with one another. Instruct one another. Accept one another as Christ accepted you. Carry one another's burdens. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Serve one another in love. I can't keep up. Encourage one another. Teach one another. Build each other up. Confess your sins to one another. And as we've just read, spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And those are just some. And I'm sure you, you, you knew those. But, but just to bring them all together, I believe that to love one another doesn't just mean that we're nice to one another. It means that we understand that the relationship we're in as brothers and sisters in this Christian family is one of mutual interdependent help and support. And that if those of us that are nominated as leaders are leading well, what we're doing is we're releasing the one anothering in our groups. The problem with the language of leadership is often it's used in the singular, the leader, which I think is not a biblical way of thinking. And, and it kind of creates instantly a hierarchy. There's someone at the top that does clever stuff and the rest of us just follow along behind. 
That is not the image of, of, of New Testament leadership. And I would suggest that a, a, the wise leader embraces this mindset of being someone that's trying to release the gifting and the potential that's in others for the sake of others. The one anothering mentality. Um, and in a small group in particular, this is a tremendous resource, isn't it? Because immediately this takes some of the pressure off of the leader, thinking they've got to be the multi-competent pastoral carer, Bible teacher, um, whatever else. Um, and actually say, no, within, within the group, let, let, let's try and release this multi-gifted little community to really understand how it can help one another. And not everybody... Sometimes, in some churches, and the problem with me today is that I'm having to generalise because I don't know all your specific situations, but sometimes the way that churches are set up disempower people from believing that they could do any of this stuff. So, um, you know, we appoint a youth worker and then we no longer have to do youth work. Uh, <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's, it, but the problem is when we appoint professionals or when we identify people in key roles, everybody else breathes a sigh of relief and thinks we don't have to do it anymore, which, of course, is not the point. The point is that the church is a multi-gifted family, or to use the other New Testament metaphor, a body of many parts, each of which need one another. Paul puts it really strongly in Romans 12, doesn't he? He says, you, you belong to one another. That's really countercultural in our individualistic age. You want somewhere where I can go and get... A lot of people, the tendency, the temptation is to use church a bit like we use a motorway service station. You know? No one wants to live in a motorway service station, right? You don't want a deep relationship with the person that serves you coffee. What you want to do is to charge off the busy motorway, get refreshed and restored, and then dash off on your journey. And sadly, there's a kind of a way of using church that's a bit like that. I've got a really busy life. I'm into loads and loads of stuff, but I want to dip in once a week and get refreshed and recharged, and then I'm going to go, go on again. And... and, and Somehow or other, in our churches, we need to teach and model and structure ourselves so that we, we expect that this is the norm, that, that disciples are made, as I said earlier, in community. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a church to raise a disciple. We need the one anothering stuff to be happening. And if you're particularly perceptive, you'll probably notice there that not all one anothering seems to be the same. There appear to be different levels of one anothering. They're what we might call some sort of general level one anothering. Being servants of one another, encouraging one another, caring for one another, being kind to one another. Incidentally, I noticed some questions over here, but uh, thank you for writing my flip chart. That's made me feel really affirmed. So thank you. Thank you for that. I noticed you did that. And three questions, not just one. So saved anybody else having to do it. I'm not going to promise to answer them, but I will talk to you afterwards. <laughs> but but, but what part, of the, part of the answer there is, is, is um, you, know, you asked some questions about pastoral care. Um, in groups, how far should pastoral care be taken? Is pastoral care more important than scriptural knowledge? Um, it, that sounded a bit like an essay question. I wanted the word discuss at the end. Of the, that, was, that was a good one, that, that one. I think of the course that I teach on, we might put that one in. Is pastoral care more important than scriptural knowledge? Discuss. Um, <laughs> Um, but I think, for, for, for me, a lot of pastoral caring is what should be happening organically within the lives of, church, of groups such as this. I think pastoral care shouldn't be a bracketed off specialism. There may be some levels of need that small groups cannot meet and shouldn't try to meet, where specialisms are required or specialist counselling or, or whatever. But in the main, I think, the, the one-anothering dynamic encourages us to believe that we should be caring for one another, we should be supporting one another, we should be serving one another, and there's a base level, at least, of pastoral care that I think should be happening naturally without having to be programmed. That's what happens when we get together and hear that a brother or sister has got a problem or is in need or is going through a difficult patch. We, get, we cook them a meal and we take it round. We, we, we sit and talk with them. We weep with those who weep and laugh with those who laugh. That's kind of what happens. It should be what happens um, naturally. So there's a base level of, of, of one anothering. And then you might say, well, there's some ministry level one anothering. Uh, we pray for one another, we practice hospitality to one another, um, we address one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, we instruct one another. But th there's a little bit more level of input there, isn't there? There's a little bit more spiritual expectancy, maybe, uh, there in some of those one another's. But again, 
surely it's not the case that we as leaders need to pray for others. It's not what we do for others, but it's actually how we release them to do it. It's not doing ministry, but it's training ministers. If you remember my slide from what seems like last week, but it was just this morning. Uh, the, the job is not to do ministry. The job is to release ministers. So somehow or other, the, the, in our groups, we need to release people's imaginations that actually I could do this. I could contribute to this. And then there's some heavy-duty one anothering, <laughs> which maybe sounds a little bit hard going. Be subject to one another. Hmm. Maybe that's a way of getting close to what I was talking about this morning about transparency and accountability, being willing to engage with other people, to, to, to enlist their help in my own spiritual journey. Confess your sins to one another. Hmm. Stir up one another to love and good works. There's kind of thought of sort of provoking, prodding people with a stick uh, in there. And you'll love this one. Admonish one another. Somehow, the writers of the New Testament seem to think that this was normative practice in the life of a church. That actually, we should be developing people who are sufficiently spiritually mature that we can trust one another with our lives. We can listen to one another, we can help one another, um, even to the point of being in relationships where we can admonish one another. Now, just as a bit of an aside, the small group that I referred to this morning that I'm in was set up because we recognise that in most mid-sized small groups, you never get to those top four things. So when there's 12 to 15 people on the list or in the room, you don't often get to those top four things because there's just too many people there. There's not enough trust and there's too little transparency. And so the smaller group, that, such as the one that I'm in, was set up to say, actually, these one another's are really important. These are where growth happens. These are where I begin to change. And so I need to be in a kind of group where that's happening. And it may be, as I think I might have said this morning, that when we think about our small groups or the structure in our church of our small groups, that we want to find ways of structuring different levels of small group life. I mentioned John Wesley this morning a couple of times. Um, Wesley, when he had the problem, which most of us would love, hundreds of people coming to faith, what on earth do you do with them? He came up with the idea, and what he felt he couldn't do as an Anglican minister was put them in Anglican churches. Um, he didn't have much confidence in, 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 in that route. Um, he could say that. I couldn't possibly comment. But, but in, in, in the, uh, back in the 18th century, that was his, his concern. W Wesley said, the grand stumbling block to the spread of the gospel is the lives of the Christians. Which, which is worthy of some reflection, actually, in the light of all that we're saying today. Um, yeah, anyway, I won't get myself distracted on Wesley. Uh, other than to say... His solution was to borrow some structures that he had heard about and seen in the Moravian communities of his day, across in Bavaria, sort of area, <laughs> um, or as they say around here, the Bavarian aerial, um, <coughs> um, on a, a, an enlightened nobleman called Count Zinzendorf had opened up his estate to a lot of refugees, very topical, a lot of refugees flooding across Europe from Moravia, ended up on Count Zinzendorf's estate. And they were Christians, and lots became Christians, and he had to work out a way of managing them. He found a particular way of doing that, and Wesley borrowed his ideas. So what he came up with was three sizes of groups. One he called a society, met on a Friday night, and it was much like a Sunday congregation. It, there was preaching, there was teaching, there was public praying and hymn singing, uh, and, and everybody could come to the society. The only qualification for coming for Wesley's groups was if you earnestly desire to flee the wrath that is to come. <laughs> Seeker sensitive or what? <laughs> so if you really mean business, if you really want to find God, then you're welcome. It doesn't matter what you know of God or if you're the worst tin miner in the world, uh, you can come here because if you really want to know, this is the place you'll find out. But if you don't really want to know, then don't come because why would you be here otherwise? Don't, don't waste our time. So he had his society, the big group. Then he recognised, a little later, that those people in the society needed some help to grow. 
There were a number of reasons why he hit on this, but, but he hit on this eventually as a kind of what we would call a discipling strategy. And he put people into things that he called class, classes, which are a bit like a home group. They were sort of 15, 20 people that met regularly to talk about how they were doing as Christians and study the Bible together, met weekly. And to be one of the people called Methodists, you had to go to both of those meetings, otherwise you were kicked out. So if you didn't attend the society and you didn't attend the class, then Wesley would say, well, you don't mean business, do you? Go and join the Anglican Church. Uh, that was his, again, I paraphrase, but that was basically his, his, basically his attitude. And if you read his journals, you'll find stories of him riding around this country on his horse, uh, visiting societies and classes and weeding out people who clearly didn't mean business. And he seemed to kick out more people than he attracted somehow. I don't know how that happened. But anyway... After a while, he realized that even within the class system, there was a depth of relationship and life that you didn't quite get to. An honesty about the state of your soul. A depth of relationship. And so he instituted a third kind of group, which he called the band, the fellowship band, which was just, in his day, five or six people, and it existed, not for any of the other things, but purely to examine the state of one another's soul. So the, the root question for a band was, how is it with your soul? And what I'm doing today is I'm picking up some of Wesley's wisdom from the class and the band thing. But what I'm saying now is, I think sometimes it's difficult to do the whole lot in one size group. And that what you can achieve in a band-type group, which was the group I described this morning that I'm in with my friend Steve and so on, what happens in the band size group is quite hard to achieve in a group when you've got more people in the room. And what, you, what is difficult to do with what we're talking about today, and what you certainly can't do with the band size group, is impose it as a structure on people. You can't say, right, wonderful idea, I went on this training day on Saturday and this guy talked about bands. We're all going to be in bands now. We're all going to get together once a week and talk about the state of our souls. Won't it be lovely? What a blessing. Heaven's come early. People won't receive it like that. They'll receive it as a great intrusion and, and, and a bit threatening and, and so on. The word I used the hung this, this morning is really important in all of this. It's the word hunger. Bands and small groups are a means to an end. No one, I would suggest, is hungry for another meeting. The thing to raise hunger for is not the structure, the bean stick. Wouldn't it be great if you had more bean sticks? The thing to raise hunger for is the spiritual life that only the bean sticks can support. Does that make sense? So if you're, ad if you're a minister here or if you're in a position to advocate or talk to others about it, really some of this stuff doesn't work by imposition. Jesus never imposed discipleship on anyone. He called people, but he left the decision with them. And so what we need to do in our churches, I would suggest is to lavishly paint the picture of what a fully orbed, unleaded, no, fully leaded, caffeinated disciple looks like. <laughs> this wonderful Jesus life, this wonderful life, fully liberated from all the things that hold us back and hold us down, set free, nothing broken, nothing missing, this wonderful life that Jesus offers, that we start to learn how to live now. We don't get it all straight away, but we're on this wonderful process of learning to be more whole, more free, more useful, more gracious, more kind, more loving, more joyful. Who wouldn't want to be a human being like that? Well, how do I be like that? Well, you need the help of one another. Don't start with the structure. I've got this wonderful bunch of dry sticks. Start with the life. And until people are hungry for the life, they'll never really warm to the structure. And so the first challenge, whether you're a small group leader here or whether you're a minister here, is actually how do we advocate for the life, the kind of life that we're talking about here. Where I started this morning, I started there intentionally because unless you start there, the rest of the stuff just doesn't make sense. The small group is a means of grace. It's the grace that's exciting, not the means. Hmm? So you may want to consider the size of your one anothering groups. When we meet together, this is a bit of a summary slide, um, and I'm hopping around a little bit here. Um, I want to offer you, I offered you five dynamics. I'm going to offer you four elements um, to sort of cover off some of the things that I was talking about this morning. Within what happens in our group meetings, whatever resource you use, whatever Bible study you do, da -di -da -di -da, whatever DVD you watch, um, I want to suggest that you, you're constantly thinking of these four things. Firstly, 
a time of exchange, a time when that thing I talked about this morning where you can integrate what's happening outside with what's happening inside. A time of swapping stories. How's it been with me and God since last we met? You may have to work hard as a group leader to keep people focused on the with God bit, which is why it's in italics. <coughs> but, but keep asking the question. Keep modelling the answer. Keep illustrating what you mean. Keep nudging, keep probing. One of the best skills of small group leaders is asking the right questions. What does a question do? It keeps the other person in the hot seat. It keeps them thinking for themselves. So learn to ask good questions. But at a time, somehow, where you can say, how's it been since last we met? What's God been up to? What have you been up to? Where have you found life with God as, as connected and so on? Secondly, somewhere within the meeting, a time that you understand to be a time of encounter. This is where we take seriously the business that Jesus is in the room. Now, whether this is the Bible study or whether it's a discussion or whether it's watching a DVD, I'd encourage you, if you're facilitating the meeting, to set this up as a time when we're going to just try and hear God together, not a time when we're going to study the Bible. I love Bible study. I do a lot of it, so I'm not against it. But I just think this is not the dynamic we're trying to set up here. We're trying to say, actually, what we're about to do is an encounter. Jesus is in the room, and we believe that when we look at this text, he speaks through it still today. It's not that he spoke 2,000 years ago, or however many, but he, he speaks today. So we want to set our meetings up as places of encounter. What's Jesus saying? What's Jesus nudging? Has anyone got any thoughts that have come to mind while we've been looking at that? I wonder if that could be God putting that thought in your mind. Let's hear it. Let's think about it together. Does that sound like God? So a time of encounter. Lots of questions. Then a time of exploration. In this Bible study, in this conversation, on this DVD, what difference does this actually make to me? <laughs> so this is where it starts to get personal. But you work at it together. So there's some one anothering going on. And so people know one another's lives. They say, well, if, if I had your kids, I, you know, this is what I'd do. I'd leave home. <laughs> or whatever. That may not be the best way to take it. But you see what I'm trying to say. So the exploration now is not a let's sit quietly and reflect on this, but let's talk about this together. Let's help one another discover what God might be saying. Let's explore this together. And then finally, that point I was making this morning about the takeaway thing, earthing. What will I take away to do? And what can you ask me about next time? Now, I'm not offering that as a kind of wooden template for every group meeting. But again, I would suggest that those are four bits of territory that you might try and inhabit somehow in your group meetings. Any one of which missing seems to me to rob the group of some of its richness. So if it's not earthed in people's lives, and if people feel they've had to leave their life outside, it kind of becomes a bit unreal. If there isn't an encounter with God, then what are you sharing but your own ignorance? Uh, if there isn't an exploration of what difference it makes, then, then what potential is there for living differently? And if there isn't an earthing, how can you hold me accountable? So it seems to me that, although they're broad brush, and, and uh, it's a kind of a template that, I, when I lead a small group, I try and, and, and work with that template. I don't always put it out there on a piece of paper, right, now we're going to do, we've done some exchanging, we're now we're going to do some encountering. You know, it, it's a map in my head. And I try and, would move, try and move the group through that map. Um, as we work with whatever we're, we're up to that particular night. It's not universal and it shouldn't be wooden, but hopefully it's a helpful map. So just to summarise what I've offered you, if you can read it, um, this morning. On the left, the goal. Forming or making disciples. Helping one another in this great call to be a disciple and apprentice of Jesus Christ. Those dynamics which need to be present within the meeting that I talked about this morning, and then that kind of rhythm of meeting, which I've just quickly pointed to now, as a bit of a, a map for the way that you might think about how your meeting is run. Just take a few minutes uh, around the table. I'll leave that on the screen. Um, just have a few minutes and think how useful that is for where you are, where the, where the gaps are, where the possibilities are. Um, just a little bit of earthing um, as we're talking about that around the tables for four or five minutes.
thank you. So, home leg, home straight. Uh, some thoughts about leadership. Um, David had, and I had a little conversation before lunch, and, and, and just noting the fact that we use, I've used the word several times today, and yet the word leader means different things to different people, and some of us may be leading a small group, but actually not think of ourselves as a leader, and uh, actually we were the last person standing, uh, and so we've ended up by default doing something, and suddenly we've come today and we're terrified because it was bad enough before today, and now it's just got, <laughs> now it's just got 100 times worse, um, which I sort of apologise for and sort of don't. Um, so um, let me just say, share a few thoughts about leadership from, from a number of different perspectives. So I think what, what, what leaders... Here's a, here's a quote from one of these books here. Uh, forgive the long words. The leader facilitates the group by cultivating an environment and space within which each member can grow in sharing the life of Jesus with one another in their neighbourhoods and communities. There's a lot in there, and it would take a long time to really unpack that. But I think... What I like about that is that what we're trying to do as leaders is we're not trying... It's not my job to make disciples out of these 12 people. My job is somehow to create the environment in which together we can work together at our mutual discipleship. Um, and somehow or other, I'm trying to create the space, which is why that last screen that I had up with all of the boxes and stuff on it, that somehow defines the space. That, that defines the kind of group that we're trying to be a place of accountability, a place of intentionality, and so on and so forth, uh, a place where we explore and earth, and all that stuff on the previous screen. That, to me, is what it means to create the space to hold those things true and to hold those things in our hearts as leaders as we try and open up this space, this hour, next Wednesday night, or whatever it is, to this bunch of people uh, who, who are in our groups. So I, I quite like that, that, that quote, because to me it... In some sense, it takes some of the pressure off and, and it defines more clearly what I'm there to do. It's not to do everything. It's not to be the omnicompetent disciple maker. You are a disciple. I am a disciple. And when I'm in a small group, I want you to help me as much as I want to be able to help you. I've got certain gifts which I will use to help you, but you've got certain gifts that you can use to help me. I've got certain life experience that may help you, but you've got different life experience and that may help me and so on and so on. So it's, it's trying to create the space in which that one anothering that we've just talked about can happen and just providing enough boundaries and enough framework that actually we keep on track with what we're there to do. The previous screen. The primary thing, and I don't need a, a slide to say this, the primary thing any leader does is they love their people. And it's not a technical thing, it's not a leadership thing, but actually unless we show by every fibre of our being that we're for these people, then we'll never lead them. The hallmark of servant leadership, as Jesus lived it, is that you give up your lives for other people. And so there is a real challenge on us as, uh, as leaders. Uh, that This isn't a technical thing that we can be trained into. It's a heart thing that we need to explore within ourselves, really. Um, and when I say you love them, you don't necessarily like them very much. And it, it, you don't necessarily, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it, it invite, that's all right, that's all right, I'll just be honest here. Um, you know, they, they may not be people that you would have chosen to be your best mates. But as Martin Luther King said, love is always greater than like. I don't like the fact that unjust senators pass laws against my children because they're of colour, he said. But my calling is not to like them, but to love them. And love is always greater than like. And so there's something in our small groups. It may be sometimes that, that we love and like the same people. That's the best. That's, that's kind of win-win, isn't it? Uh, but sometimes uh, what we're challenged with, am I for these people? And I love the fact that Jesus clearly struggled with his disciples. How much longer have I got to put up with you? perverse and foolish idiots. You know, the, 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 you get those kind of outbursts, don't you, occasionally? It clearly wasn't easy. Uh, for Jesus, um, <laughs> and frustrating at times. I find, I find deep consolation in that. Maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> Don't tell Thornby Baptist Church. Uh, but but, but the, anyway, I won't 
go on and on about this because time's short. But, but really, I just, this is a really important point, that, that whatever technical things we now talk about, if, you, if people know you're for them, then you can get away with, <laughs> with a lot. They'll, who do you follow? You follow people who are for you. Who do you follow? You follow people who you respect. Why do you respect them? Because they're for you. Or any research that's done into leadership, whether in business or the church, always puts personal qualities above technical excellence. Honesty. Generosity. Humility. They all come up high up. What are you looking for in a leader? You're looking for a life well lived and a life that's for me. Having said that, there are different metaphors that we could use to think about, different images we could use to think about what a leader is. Sometimes, and this has infected the church through a lot of Christian leadership literature that came across in the 90s and the 2000s, we think of leadership as being like the CEO of an organisation. Uh, you need a vision, you need plans, you need a strategic plan, you need a growth target. Yeah, right. Like, um, we think about leadership as like a CEO. We're, we're in control. We're multi-competent. We're, we're going to make this thing work. We're going to drive it through. We're going to hit our goals and targets. You know, there's so much about that, which is so antithetical to whatever Christian leadership is supposed to be. It sounds far more like Herod than servant leadership to me. But anyway, I'm offending a lot of people, so I'll move on. So th th there's, there's one image, one metaphor. A more traditional one would be the image of the pastor teacher. The pastor. The leader is the pastor. And the imagery there is not about hitting goals and targets and strategic plans and vision statements. This is now about providing care. It's actually misunderstood, but that's the way it's used, that a pastor is someone who cares. Actually, a pastor is someone who leads. The word pastor comes from shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd. He leads me. There's a connection between shepherding, pastoring, and leadership that's much more direct and much more helpful than the link between CEO and leadership. But anyway, in our small groups, I'm getting overcomplicated here. I can hear my wife's voice at the back of my head. Uh, in, uh, do you hear voices? Uh, I, hear one, I hear one voice frequently, and it's, it's usually disapproving. Get on with it! Uh, <clears throat> So the pastor-teacher metaphor, is that what we are for our small groups? Are we the people that pastor them and that teach them? I would suggest, no, that's not what we're about. That's not the metaphor that I've been trying to set up. I don't think that's a healthy metaphor to use for, for small group leadership of the kind we've been talking about today. Um, another uh, metaphor is, is, is kind of the cog turner. <laughs> I'm just the person that keeps the show on the road. I'm part of this machine, I organise the programme, I put round the rotor. Of course there's a rotor, we're Christians. I, I, I make sure that the books are there, I make sure that Mrs Jones has got a lift because her dodgy hip is playing up again. You know, so I just keep the cogs turning. Uh, I, I meet a lot of small group leaders who kind of get into this mentality a bit. that I, I just organise it and keep the show on, on, on the road. I didn't ask to be a leader and... Certainly didn't ask to be a disciple maker. Goodness me, the stakes have just been raised enormously. And, uh, I don't think any, I think each of those, yes, there is a time when we need a bit of vision. Yes, there's a time when we need certainly pastoring and teaching. Yes, there is a time when somebody needs to keep the show on the road, otherwise they'd be all fall off the road. But I, a metaphor that I've begun to use more frequently, and I got it from a man called Alan Roxburgh, who writes books about leadership, is the old ancient metaphor of the abbot, or the abbess. Not the abscess, that's different. The abbess. <laughs> the abbot or the abbess. That here is someone who understands their role to only make sense in terms of a community of people. And their heart for that community of people is that they grow in Christ-likeness. And whatever organising they do and so on, that is determined by the goal of forming this community of people into being more like Christ. Now, of course, there's organising to do, there might be pastoring to do, I'm not sure how much CEOing there is to do, but, but the, the defining vision is one of disciples formed in community. And I, quite, I think there's a lot of mileage in sort of reflecting on our roles through that ancient lens of thinking about, in my small group, how about if I thought of myself as a person whose heart is towards seeing these people becoming more like Christ? My primary motivation is not to outwork some sort of plan or to achieve some sort of goals. I'm, my primary motivation is not to be the person that somehow magically manages to fix all of their needs. But my primary motivation is to see these people grow in Christ. Because it's my primary motivation for me too. 
I think there's something about that metaphor which, which kind of moves us forward a little bit in the kind of small groups that I've been trying to describe today. Formation of individuals in community. So let me get a little bit more nuts and boltsy. Um, I'm going to borrow here from a leadership theorist called John Adair. Anyone read any books by John Adair? Have heard of John Adair? It's been around a while now. He's written lots of books on leadership, but they're all the same. So never buy more than one book. <laughs> never buy more than one book by John Adair, because basically you get the same thing. Um, but he's just come up with this little, this, this little diagram to describe what a leader does. So there are different ways of coming at leadership. What a leader is, what a leader knows, and he's, he's interested in what a leader does. You know, what is it you actually do? Um, and he just defines it by this little diagram, which is just three overlapping circles. And he says, what, what a leader does is that the leader is the person who has the vision for what the group is about strongly in their heart. So they're the, per they're the people who actually are concerned that this group achieves its task. Now, in business terms, you know, he used the word task to mean makes 10 million sausages a year or whatever. But, but I'm borrowing the language and saying that as small group leaders, um, our job is to hold, hold true to this vision. Because there'll be all sorts of people who want to take things in other directions, but somehow or other, we want to be those who have the vision in our heart that we're about being a group of people who are helping one another grow to be disciples of Jesus Christ, apprentices of him, so that we're changed inwardly and live differently outwardly. That's what we're about. And... Um, uh, Josephine Bax, who's a writer on leadership as well, she, she said that the leader is the keeper of the vision. And I quite like that phrase, the keeper of the vision, or the leaders. Hopefully you're leading with more than one person. It's always team for me. But, but the leaders are the keepers of the vision because other people will bring their own vision. They won't mean to do that, but, but the Women's Institute thing will happen and suddenly will become a knitting circle or a social club or a friendship group or a Bible study for its own purpose, or whatever. So, so suddenly it will get hijacked. So, so, so the thing that the leader does is they carry in their heart what this is all about. And I find it helpful where, where I'm in Thornbury. You know, we get our small group leaders together quite frequently just to keep reinforcing that this is what we're about because as, a, as one of the, the leadership team of the church, my job is to keep that in my heart and then to keep putting it in other people's hearts. So I'm trying to keep saying to people, look, we're, I know there's all sorts of things we're doing, but let's remind ourselves, we're here to this. We're here to make disciples of Jesus Christ who love God, love one another, and love the world. How are we doing at that? How are we doing at that? Um, so the, 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 you're the keeper of the vision. We, we, we're bent on achieving the task. Um, but to do that, we recognize that we have a role. This is second circle. In his model, he says, build the team, because he's talking about leadership, but I'm talking about the group. Our concern as group leaders is, is, as I've said, this is the one anothering stuff. We're trying to make this group about the group, not about us as leaders. We're trying to actually say, when I run the group, when I run next Wednesday night, how can I do that in such a way that people are drawn in, so that people are involved, so that people are using their gifts, so that people have the confidence to pray? How can I build up the group as group is the question there. And some of the things we talked about this morning are some of the ways of doing that. And... Uh, reflecting on the more might help you get to that more and then thirdly he says that the group is actually not a group at all but it's a collection of individuals so you also have to pay attention to the lives of the individuals within the group and groups become dysfunctional usually because of what's going on in the lives of individuals so there are times as a leader of a small group where you need not just to deal with the group but where you need to spend time with individuals within the group who maybe are struggling or being unhelpful uh, in their contributions, don't know when to shut up, the verbal diarrhea thing, uh, or, 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 or perhaps never contributing and you just need a quiet word and say, you know, is, is it difficult for you uh, at the moment? And, and how can we work this through? Because we'd love you to be contributing, but you just find it quite difficult. So having some of those perhaps sometimes more challenging conversations with people uh, but trying to develop, because your heart is not just to have them in the room on Wednesday night. I'm sure some of you don't meet on Wednesday night, so don't feel excluded. Uh, the heart is not just to have them in the room, but the heart is to have them one anothering and growing as disciples. And if it feels like that's not happening to people, then we need to have those personal and private conversations uh, with them, just to help them. 
Now, through that nice, tidy three-circle diagram, he drives uh, a wedge, or a couple of lines, um, and says that there are a number of related tasks to those three headline intentions. To do... Now, that's annoyed some of you, hasn't it? Because you've just drawn on the old piece of paper a <laughs> diagram that's filled right up to the right-hand margin. <laughs> and I've just introduced the possibility that you're going to have to write something down the right-hand side of the page. I do apologise. This is all on what you'll get downloadable from the website. Uh, so you will have this uh, in your notes if you want to download them. Um, so these are the things, or at least slight variations, uh, my variations of, of, of his things. It's a development of that first thing, really, that, 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 that the leaders need to keep defining and sustaining the task. This is why we're here, remember? So when you produce leaflets, when you send emails, the headline is always, our, our group exists to help make disciples of Jesus Christ, or whatever language you use. Keep reinforcing the vision. Define and sustain the task. Make sure that everybody keeps hearing that language. When you plan your program, his second thing is make plans. You know, a, a, a vision without some means of putting it into practice is just a dream, isn't it? It's, 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 so if your vision is to make disciples, how are you going to do that? So this is where you do your program planning bit. You look at resources. You talk with other people and say, you know, we've got a bunch of people here who don't seem to be able to pray. Have you done anything good? Well, maybe we could do the HTB prayer course. Maybe that, maybe that would help or, or, or whatever. So you, you begin to actually plan around your intention to make disciples. You make sure that map that I gave you this morning with all the E's in it, the, well, I can't remember them myself now, so you're never going to remember them, are you? The, the, the earthing, engaging bit. Uh, you make sure that that's kind of in your planning for the future. You communicate. This is his third thing. One of, the, one of the defining things about leaders is they communicate regularly and often. You keep, you know, we've got in, in one of our groups, do you do WhatsApp? Have you heard of a mobile phone? <laughs> yes. This mobile phone, WhatsApp is just a way of sending group emails. Uh, you may or may not like it, but uh, group texts, sorry. Um, but a couple of groups I'm in, we've just set up as a WhatsApp group, which means we can constantly be communicating. It's a gift of the age, isn't it, really? Uh, so somebody's going to the dentist, somebody's going to, to speak to their neighbour, somebody's wanting to share their faith that day, wh whatever it is. And so we're, we're constantly communicating, and, and there's a sense that... Because our small group is not a midweek meeting, it's a small community that exists all week. Another mental shift for us, maybe. But I've been working with that assumption all day. So communicate, 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 keep, keep communicating and keep people reminded of, 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 of who we are, why we're here, what we're doing. Monitor progress, he says, this is his fourth thing. How are we doing? And then fifthly, his fifth thing linked to it is to evaluate progress. Are we doing what we, you know, what's the evidence that we're really making disciples here? Now, one of the things that we'll have to discover is that often numbers don't work anymore. You can't count that. So what you need to listen to as a leader, not numbers, but narrative. What are the stories that I'm hearing about people's walk with Jesus? about people's living it out in everyday life, about how they're seeing their workplace, about how they're dealing with their problems. And what I would be looking for as a leader is not a change in numbers. There are more people in my group. That may or may not be indicating of anything. But I'll be looking for narrative indicators as to the fact that we're actually make, we are making disciples. You know, Joan, bless her heart, she said she prayed with her neighbour. Well, she'd never prayed with anyone, as far as I know. If you're called Joan or you know someone called Joan, that wasn't the person I was talking about. It was a random name I just pulled out of here. Uh, but we evaluate progress. And one way to do that would be to use the screen, that I, the, the summary screen that I had up two or three screens ago with all of the boxes on. To use that screen that I gave you, and that's why I gave it to you partly, with all three columns on it, to look at that occasion and say, how are we doing? If this is a helpful map, or tweak it, change it, do what you want with it, but, but to create some sort of template for this is the kind of group we want to be, and this is the goal we're after, what's the evidence? And that's where small group leaders and other leaders in the life of the church should be talking together and, and, and working that one out together. It's not just the small group leader or leaders themselves that, 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 that would do that. Uh, touched on this really. He says you need to engage the group, keep everybody involved, Keep everybody one anothering. And finally, he puts at the end, the sting in the tail, which one might have put at the beginning, 
Be an example of all the stuff that you're trying to get people to be and do. Easy. <laughs> but that is, you know, that's Jesus' advice, isn't it, through Peter to the leaders in, in, in the book of Peter. Uh, you know, J.B. Phillips' translation of that verse, he says, don't be little tin gods in the eyes of the flock. Uh, you know, you're not there to lord it over people, but be servants. Wear the apron of, of, of humility. You are supposed to be modelling this thing, not just mandating it. It's what I do, not what I say. Which leads me to my final slide. Um, moving on from John Adair to Jesus. It's a long step, but we'll do it in one... Uh, <laughs> We'll do it in one step. I don't know if there's anything helpful there, but I, I found that over the years in leadership, it's, it's, you know, it can be, again, a bit wooden and so on, but I found some helpful stuff in that, um, just 